Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Pastor Mark Motor, Berean Church in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. Pete Giacalone, lead pastor, South Hills Assembly Guy Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level Ministries in the North Hills area. Well, pastors, I always say this, but I'm always excited when we get a chance to dig into these questions. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Today we've got topics, communion, tree of life, and aging. Now, I don't know anybody on this panel that's aging, okay? So uh, we'll, we'll be uh, taking all of those questions, but we're taking hotline questions, and this is where you call in. So let's start with this one. Garden of Eden, why did God put the tree of life and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil and subject that to Adam and Eve where the consequences would be if you eat uh, the one tree, you're going to die, which they didn't know what dying was. They didn't know what the consequences were or what it all entailed because they lived in the uh, uh, atmosphere or utopia. So if God loved Adam and Eve so much, why did he subject them to that? Where you as a normal father would not place any harm close to your own child. All right, we well, thank you for that question. And this is something that hits right at the, the whole nature of God, nature of man. Pastor Jay, why don't you start us off? Take a deep Here breath after that one, right? You know, <laughs> but go. you know, you have to think about it too. Uh, when you're answering this question, he, we're talking about it from a post fall. Now at the time when God was talking to Adam and to Eve, there was no sin in the earth. Man was never meant to know good and evil. We were meant to know life. That's why he said, now man has become like us. The product of us knowing good and evil and having that conscience and dealing with all of that and figuring things out was never what God originally intended. He didn't want us to have to be in that situation. So people say, well, why would God do that knowing this? Well, we were never supposed to know any of this anyways. Mm -hmm. But because we were fallen, now we're battling with these two types of things. And people always ask the question as well, well, why would God allow um, Adam and Eve to do that knowing if they were going to fall? Well, first of all, he's God. Number two, we have to realize as well, the reason why he put both trees in the garden is because you can't be a worshiper and you can't be obedient if you don't have options. Yeah, that's right. that's so there right. must be options. And I always believe that the reason why God did that is that we are Lucifer's replacement. There is the warfaring angel who is Michael. There is the messenger uh, who is Gabriel. And then there was the worshiper who was Lucifer. Well, when Lucifer was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels, there was the worshiping atmosphere that was not there anymore. So what does the Bible say Jesus said he looks for? He looks for one that will worship. Well, why? That's why Lucifer was put down there because he is the antagonistic part of the worship. So he's left there and God says, I'm going to put both of these trees there to give you an opportunity to determine whether or not you can share with me in my glory. So that's the whole purpose of this whole life, in my opinion, is that who can God share his glory with and will we become the worshipers he's called to be? And without having those two choices, there cannot be a true definition. Choice of is a big and, part of and this. And something that what I read into this and I, as I heard him, I heard him say the idea of the consequences. Uh, remember, these two were extremely intelligent people. Uh, the Bible says that God brought all the animals to Adam and Adam named them, them all. Mm -hmm. And then the thing was, Eve and Adam both knew what their consequences were to their choices. God explained to them, so they knew what death was. What I'm getting from this question, he was saying that they, had, they did not know what the consequences were going to be. They knew the consequences, but yep, knowing the consequences, the Bible says that what Adam ate knowingly, that's mm -hmm. what the scripture, mm -hmm. he actually ate knowingly. Eve was deceived, but he ate knowingly what he was mm -hmm. doing. That's a good point, Pete, because they it's had a, this, we don't know how long, this right. time of eternal <clears throat> bliss in the Garden of Eden where they were walking with God, so he would have explained it to them. They knew. Yeah. They knew the consequences. That's the place. Yeah, well, I, you know, when, when you look at it, uh, to me, the bottom line is God wants us, as Jay talked about the choices, uh, he wants us to make choices too because we love him. You know, he could have made us robots, 
and he could have made us, you know, uh, follow everything that he commanded and, you know, would, you know, just go, you know, like, like the robot and follow along. But, but God wants us to choose uh, mm -hmm. right and choose him, you know, and right. so that's, that's why there's options. If God made us uh, love him, then is that really love? you know, when you're forced to, to do it. So I think that that's a part of it too. And then he gave man authority. And when you think about the authority, you know, uh, and I'm gonna go piggyback on something that Pete said, that he had to know about death. Cause you know, from the question that the, uh, the gentleman is asking, it seems like he said, well, they didn't have any concept. Not, not by experience, they right, didn't have it, right, but right. they knew about death and they knew about consequences because God gave them authority. And I don't think that he would give somebody authority and them not know what consequences are. Right, right, absolutely. Mark. And in God's foreknowledge, he did know that Adam and Eve would sin, but he also know, knew that Jesus was going to come right. and redeem mankind. And I love something the Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So even though there was a fall and God recognized that, he knew there was redemption and Jesus was going to pay the price. So the best choice we can make is I choose Jesus and redemption becomes part of Amen. my life. Amen. Amen. You know, I think this is a, it was a great question, a great question to start off with and I appreciate the, the caller calling in because this is something that people have wondered and talked about for centuries. But the thing is, we have a choice now are we going to choose to follow Jesus and choose to obey God as well? Thank you for the for that. Let's go to our next one. Hi. Um, I was wondering, is there aging in heaven? Or does everyone stay the same age they are when they go there? Um, and if that's, if it's true, then what about babies that are premature or die in a miscarriage or something? Okay, uh, good question, Pete. All right, First uh, John chapter three, verse, verses two to three. Beloved, now we are the children of God and has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. And of course the apostle Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We're gonna talk about that later. Um, we shall be, so I, I believe as I read this portion of scripture, we're going to be like him. God is ageless. Mm -hmm. You know, we deal with time and age, but if we're going to be like him, and matter of fact, we, he made us in his image in the very beginning. He really made our bodies never to die in the beginning, but because of the fall, the, our, our bodies, and because of sin, our bodies will corrupt. But God designed every human being never in the beginning to die. So I really believe with all my heart, we will be like him, meaning time will have no effect on us. We will be ageless. So, so if a baby dies, right. they're not going to be a baby in heaven. I don't, no, I don't believe be a that. fully conscious, you know, uh, mature adult. Yes. We can't prove or disprove this, but I was reading that some people feel that babies, if they die, would be fast forwarded to an ideal age maybe like an older person would be rewound to the ideal age. And some people say it could know. be. I think 66 is the ideal age myself. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you, some... you see that story of Forever 21? I asked yeah. my wife, where's Forever 66 at? Yeah. I don't know, you know, but anyway. Well, some guess that it could be 33 years of age because that's how old Jesus died. We don't really know, but it's something interesting. You think about 30, 33, somewhere in there where you're the prime of life. Uh, we don't know, but that's one that's one thought. I don't think a baby is going to remain a baby, uh, but we'll find out when we get there. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. I, I think that. Well, I think we're trying to bring a temporal thing into an eternal thing, and I think that's yeah. hard to do. We're trying to figure out, okay, how do we fit earth into heaven in eternity? Yeah, and I so I don't know necessarily if there's even going to be an age. We're talking about glorified, not physical bodies. Right. We're talking about a whole different yeah. thing that we're going to step into. So I think looking at that is important as well because we're trying to figure out, okay, are they gonna look like your age? Are they gonna look like my age? I don't think they look like any of our ages because right. I, don't, I think when we transition into there, we're gonna have a completely different body that is gonna be able to do things that we've never even seen before. think about our body and our mind fully functioning as, yeah. as it was intended. I mean, yeah. we're gonna see something uh, beyond anything we can know. Well, we'll we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back in 60 seconds, we ask, why does God take so long to answer our prayers. Stay tuned. <laughs> Well, 
Well, welcome back to Hard Questions. And today we're taking on the hotline questions. Let's listen to the next one. Hi. I had a question. I love this station. I love all the programming. And I love how on Move Your Mountain they do communion. My question is, say you're someone who, for whatever reason, your physical locale, you, you're watching, you know, um, move your mountain and they're doing communion if you don't have physical access to elements um, for communion do you think that the intent of your heart lets you receive communion in a spiritual sense without the the physical elements i believe so and i'd love to hear what all the um ministers think love of the program thank you for being there god bless you well thank you for watching i'm glad to hear that you love the program and this is an interesting question it brings up a lot of different things to my mind pastor bill well you know i don't think that it's the uh the the focus of the elements but it's the focus of the heart that you know i, I I've, I've taken communion where we drank water and you know, we might have had a loaf of bread and, and kind of, you yeah. know. So, you know, the, the, the key is, is that when you're taking it, because, you know, if, if, if that's the case, you know, then, you know, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You so, you know, we know that some religions have that as their uh, what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can't literally eat his body mm -hmm. and drink his blood. But so these these are symbols that represent the body and blood. So whatever the symbol is that now, now traditionally, you know, uh, and, and they've got these new things out now, right? Yeah. Where, where it all comes in one, you know, yeah. you got the, yeah. the, the you they got the juice. Peel that off right yeah, right, right. Well, well, you know, when, whenever I serve <laughs> communion, I make sure that mine is already off <laughs> because, <laughs> with you on that one. <laughs> because yeah. I don't want to be oh, up there, yeah. you know, do, doing it. Yeah. But, but, you know, just think how it's observed in different ways in different t traditions. So it's really not the elements, you know, it's the heart, you know, and if, if while you're taking it, you know, you think about the fact that man, Christ's body was broken for me and his blood was shed for me and that's why I'm saved and, and that's where your heart is at. You know, I think that if you have elements that represent that, that God is pleased with that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think what you were referring to is that from a certain denomination, transubstantiation, where it actually becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. And we know without a doubt, it, like you said, mm -hmm. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So I, I believe like what is taught here at, at Channel 40, that if you don't have access to grape juice, I believe God will still honor that. It's the idea of what the whole purpose is, we're remembering the death, the burial, the resurrection. And, and we also are warned that we do it with the right attitude. Because yeah. you know we're you know we're warned to examine ourselves. I think, I think that, you know that that's a really good point, and I, I know that in, in most of the times that in the churches that I've been a part of, they usually say something about you know examine yourself in, and see that there's no sin in there, no sin that you're walking in, so that you can have a you know a, a not drink condemnation unto yourself. But I have another question. It's not in here, so I'm just springing this on you guys. Why do we need to remember Jesus through communion at all? I mean, uh, obviously, because he commanded it. But I mean, we have Christ living inside of us. I have actually pondered this. I mean, we have Christ living inside of us. We walk with them daily. Why communion? Why this kind of ritualistic thing to remember him? Any ideas, any thoughts on that? I think it's a pause in our lives to take the time to reflect. Uh, one of the phrases I like is, to me, it can be a point of contact. Lord, I'm receiving forgiveness. And I believe there's not only forgiveness, but there's healing through the bread because by Jesus stripes, we are healed. So we receive forgiveness. We receive healing at that time. And it's, I think as a congregation, it's a really powerful time of, of gathering together, connecting with heaven, and then connecting with one another. But it's prophetic. In, in Luke chapter 22, 14 through 20, listen to this. And this is just amazing. I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is where he says, I have desired to, to eat. I have desired to desire. Then he says, then he took the cup and, and, and gave thanks. He said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God. So this is something prophetic that there's yeah. going to be a glorious communion time. 
Uh, so it's, it's, there's something more there than what we realize. Yeah, I think the same thing that you mentioned as well. Um, I think it gives the opportunity because we forget. And I think sometimes we have to be careful too that we don't do communion so often that it just becomes, uh, you know, just ritualistic. Yeah. And yeah. so sometimes it's good, to, like you said, to pause and to remember what happened and ask God, Lord, show me afresh what this body, if he told us to do it as often, yeah. then there's a reasoning behind it. And mm -hmm. so we need to dig deep and understand the mystery of his body and of his blood and how we can appropriate that in our lives. Because it says uh, later on down the line, many are weak, sickly, and even sleep because you did not rightly discern. So, so yeah. there's something about it that God wants us to dig into that'll help us. So we mentioned, and I, I want to just dwell on this a little bit more. We mentioned that it's symbolic, it's a symbolic view. But there's a power there too, yeah. isn't there, Pastor Glaze? It seems like there's a whenever I take communion, there's a there's a, a spiritual mm -hmm. thing that happens as well. Right. Yeah. Because you know, again, if you if you really pause to think about it, you're connecting with the the broken body and the mm. shed blood of of Jesus Christ, yeah. and and that's what our salvation is all about. So I believe, yeah, you're right. There there is that spiritual connection that takes place, and, and again. Uh, you know, as, as Baptists, you know, we teach that it's symbolic. Yeah. Uh, and and, and I, I do believe that, but I believe that it's, it's beyond symbolic. I believe that there's a spiritual connection yes. with it too. And that, you know, it touches your heart in, in a special way. Well, I think that that, you mentioned it, Pete. And I think for a long time I've wrestled with, okay, is it, there's, I never believed in transubstantiation that it actually becomes the, the, the body and blood, but is it, purely symbolic. So there's kind of like this, uh, I won't say middle ground, but yeah. it's symbolic with power. God revealed this to me one time. I was doing, taking communion to an individual's home. And as I was breaking the host, I'll never forget it. It came to me. Wholeness, Christ was broken for all of our brokenness, physical, spiritual, mental, financial, emotional, all of our brokenness to be made whole. Yeah. Yeah. So when, I, when we break that, we declare, he was broken for all of, wholeness was broken for all of our brokenness. So we can believe to be made whole. So we can believe, and then the blood cleanses, the blood purifies. Wow, that's great. So there's healing well, and communion. I appreciate that, that discussion. There's a lot more there. Thank you for the question. Let's move on to the next one. Um, yeah, how come it takes a long time for God to answer a prayer? Like if you've been praying for like, say a couple years and you don't see any change and um, what you're asking, like, you know, in your prayer, why does it take long for him to answer a prayer that you want something in your life to change, but it's not changing? I think this is one that we have all had yeah. at one yeah. time or another. Yeah. Pete. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3, it's God's phone number. Call unto me and I will answer and show you great mighty things which you know not. But again, God's timing is different from our timing. We, right. we always refer to Pentecostal time. We refer to uh, you know, the, uh, the 12th hour at 1159. Mm -hmm. but, but the thing is, uh, if we were to use the example of Daniel, Daniel prayed and, and when the angel appeared to him, he says, I was on my way the very moment you prayed, but I was hindered. Yeah. So there's, there's times God says, wait, we don't want that. There's times God says, no. And, and there's times that God says, yes. Some, I, I, if I can show, share real quick, I remember one time our, our, Food bank was in desperate need of money, desperate need of money. And uh, I, I'm praying alone and I, and I just said, Father. That's all I said, Father. My phone went off. And it said, how much do you need? You can't make this up. Mm -hmm. How much do you need and don't be shy? I, I, I really need a thousand. I said, 500. And the, and the reply was, a thousand would be better. Now you can't make this up. You can't. I really uh, that's, that's a, I didn't know God had your phone number like that. You know? It was a dear friend of mine. Uh, Mark. There is definitely an aspect of God's timing. Uh, we had a church member who had moved from Pittsburgh to another state. They had a house they had, were trying to sell for about a year. Nothing happened. They prayed. They fasted. They pulled every lever. They pushed every button. Nothing was taking place. All of a sudden, she turned 55 the very next day it sold. And she came to find out after the fact that there were great tax benefits once you're 55 years of age. Wow. So That's even so though good. she didn't recognize so it, God good. knew Come what on. he was doing yes. and he made great See, provision aging wow. is a good thing. That's what we were talking <laughs> yeah, about. You know, aging That's is a good, good thing. So any, any final words on the... Well, I, I think that when you start praying, 
God releases his power on that situation. Right. Regardless of what's happening down here, God has unleashed his power because you started praying in that situation. Yeah. So now we just wait for the manifestation yes. of it. That's yeah. right. That's right. Well, great question. One that we've all had. Well, we're going to take a quick break and afterwards we ask, how do you get the devil to stop bothering you? Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Hard Questions. We're taking your hotline questions. And remember, you can always call in and we'll share that at the end of the show. But uh, here is our last hotline question today. Hi, how do you get the devil to stop bothering you? It's a big problem with me. How do we get rid of the devil to stop bothering me? All right. We might have to define this a little bit about what's going on, but <laughs> Pastor Jay, t take us uh, off here. Well, you know, there's a couple of different things that come to mind. You know, one, do we have any open doors? Because if we've got doors opened, devil, the devils understand legal right. So sometimes we've opened doors, so we need to make sure there's no sin, nothing in our lives that's allowing the devil to have access to us to torment us. Number two, and I'll say this and I'll pass it on to the rest of the fellows. Uh, how do I get the devil to stop bothering me? Keep bothering him. The Bible says the gates of hell won't prevail. So if there's nothing in your life that you're aware of that you've done wrong, the reality is that you are on the offense if you need to go in and dispossess the enemy. And God has put you in the middle of the conflict because he, he's anointed you with the keys to the kingdom to go in and dispossess the enemy and to take what it is that God has for you. Yeah. We're not going to get rid of the devil. He, he's here as long as we're here. But we do know this, James 4, 7, we know the verse well, resist the devil right. and he'll flee from you. But that's the second part of the first. Right. Right. The beginning says, therefore submit to God. And a lot of people want the resistance of the devil without submitting to their savior. So it's important to say, Lord, I submit to you, to your point, I wanna make sure there are no open doors. Sometimes we call them blessing blockers, no blessing blockers, because if you're fully submitted to God, when you resist the devil, That's he right. will flee. That's right. Now he won't flee permanently, but he will flee for a season. So it's so important to say, Lord, first of all, I submit to you, you're my Lord. Then when I resist the devil, he will flee. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? I can remember in my own life, periods of time where I've committed myself to mm -hmm. seek after God. And I can remember feeling like completely free from temptation, mm -hmm. oppression, everything. And then a few months down the road, it was like the devil was leaning against the, the, yeah. the, the side of the wall as I was coming out of the house or something. He's like, remember me? <laughs> you know, and, 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 and like you said, it's not gonna, he's not going to leave forever. But when we resist him consistently, he's going to flee. Pete. Well, again, um, I, I'm reminded that, that the more as we submit to God, what happens? God becomes more developed or enveloped in us. So the enemy will see more of him than seeing of us. And yeah. he's got to, he doesn't want to be anywhere in the presence, the manifested presence of Almighty yeah. God. So he's going to run from that. So the more we stay in the Lord, more we stay in the word, the more the enemy is not going to want anything to do with us. Yeah, I, I wrote a book and the title of the book is uh, 50 Ways to Resist the Devil. Uh, actually based on that Paul Simon song, <laughs> yeah, 50, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. You got, got that? I got it up in my office. Oh, okay. yeah, that's a good right. book. <laughs> and, 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 and basically what the book deals with is, you know, th there's the word rhema. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that lives out, uh, comes out of the mouth of God. That word rhema actually means the, the word of God as you claim it, as you interact against whatever you're dealing with. So if Satan is coming against me, as this lady right here is saying, what she needs to begin to do is to take rhemas in whatever area he's attacking her in, she needs to find a scripture. And she, as she finds that scripture, it becomes a rhema. Not, not where you just read it out of rote memory, but it's one that, is, that you believe in your heart. It's one that, you know, uh, has a hold of your spirit. And that when Satan comes against you, you stand against him with that rhema. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he'll flee uh, every time. Because, you know, what the, what, when Jesus was in the wilderness, tempting, uh, and Satan tempted him, what right. did he do? Rhemas. Yeah. He, he quoted the rhema of God and Satan left him. 
Yeah. He, he quoted said, the Old quick, Testament. Can I say this real fast? And then we, after that, though, that's what I want to mention, said, then the devil left him until a more opportune. That word opportune is kairos, which means a God moment in your life. So when you see Satan showing up, it's because you are on the verge of something good happening. Absolutely. You know, this is, a, this is the thing. We are going to have difficulties in this life, and we are going to have temptations. We're going to have even oppression at times. But God is able to deliver us out of that all. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, sister, just, you know, stand with the Lord in all those things. Well, we lo love to close with the scripture. And so we have this one. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. Therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. That's Matthew 10. 29 through 31. Well, we hope that you've enjoyed today's program. I know I enjoy this time. I enjoy the chance to, to talk to the pastors and hear their answers. And we want to hear from you. We heard from so many today. We're hearing from some more in the future. We want you to email your questions to hardquestions at ctvn.org or call to our hotline at 412-349-4326. God loves you. Have a wonderful day.